Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to you all. And thank you all so much for joining us today on this Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. Um, today, we'll be joined by representatives from Transportation for America, Green Lots, the Electrification Coalition, as well as the Federal Highway Administration for a conversation on federal EV policy. What's coming next? That's the big question. Um, my name is Simbia Yusuf. I'm the member relations manager at Ford. And before we start our roundtable discussion today, I have a few updates from the Ford team. Attendees, uh, we ask that you please be sure to submit all your questions through the attendee chat. We'll be taking those questions as we go today. Uh, since there are no formal presentations, we'll be having a roundtable discussion. And as always, we'll be sending the webinar presentation to you all shortly after the presentation today. So stay tuned for that. And we'll also be including additional resources to help further the discussion um, from our uh, panelists today. Uh, who are we? Uh, fourth, we are on a mission to electrify transportation. We bring people together through our work in consumer engagement, policy advocacy, um, demonstration project, and industry development um, to advance the transportation industry, the electric transportation industry. So we hope if you want to learn more about Fourth, our work, what we've done, what we're doing, what the future holds, you can find that information on our website at fourthmobility.org. And as always, we want to thank our members and uh, sponsors for the opportunity to bring these webinars to you all. Um, we can't do this without the support of them. If you would like to learn more about sponsorship opportunities for the webinars or membership app or to support our mission and our goals, uh, you can reach directly out to me, Symbia Yusuf. My email is on the screen, or you can go on our website as well. And we want to make sure you're registered for the Roadmap Conference, which is happening uh, in June, June 29th through the 30th. If you haven't saved on registration, you can still save using the early adopter rate. Uh, program will be announced shortly soon, so stay tuned. More information about the conference, but save day and register now. And now I'll pass it along to our moderator today, Chris Rawl, Outreach Director for Transportation for America. Chris? Thank you, Cindy. And so um, I'm, I'm charged with moderating this. I'm very excited uh, because we've got such a great um, group of panelists today with just a lot of expertise from some different perspectives. So I'm going to start off by introducing all of them. And if you could all, um, as I introduce you, turn on your turn on your camera. So we'll start with um, Josh Cohen, who is the Director of Policy at Greenlots. Josh serves as Greenlots focal point for policy and regulatory engagement in a number of states in the eastern U.S. and federally. Josh's priorities include growing the market for transportation electrification and enhancing its value proposition through software-based managed, managed charging, interoperability and open protocols, and equitable access. Before joining Greenlots, Josh, Josh served in policy and communications roles at SemiConnect and the business network for Offshore Wind and hosted the Clean Energy Podcasts, More Power to You and Offshore Wind Insider. He has also served in a number of public sector leadership positions, including as mayor of Annapolis, Maryland, and as deputy administrator of the Rural Utilities Service during the Obama administration. Thanks for being here, Josh. Um, Chris Bast is the Director of EV Infrastructure Investments for the Electrification Coalition. He leads the organization's work to manage and support federally funded charging infrastructure and EV deployment projects at the state and local levels. Prior to joining the EC, Chris served as Chief Deputy Director of the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. He provided strategic communication and policy support for the agency and worked across the Northern administration, or sorry, the Northam administration uh, to advance um, a comprehensive climate agenda. His work included 
transportation decarbonization, environmental justice, climate policy, and carbon markets. Chris received his undergraduate degree from James Madison University, where he currently serves as the political science alumni board, on the political science alumni board. He, he received his MPA from Seattle University. Uh, Coral Torres is the senior advisor to the Office of the Administrator at Fe the Federal Hi Highway Administration. In this capacity, Coral helps the agency with the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law provisions and new programs, including the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, NEVI formula program, and charging and fueling discretionary programs. Coral has done extensive work at USDOT, including implementation of MAP21 and FAST Act freight and environmental programs. She also served as FTA's strategic advisor and worked on several special projects, including development of USDOT's 2018 through 2022 strategic plan and development of guidance for federal sustainability efforts at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Coral has a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Puerto Rico and a master's in civil and transportation engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Diane Turchetta transportation, is the transportation specialist in FHWA's Office of Natural Environment and primarily works on transportation and sustainability issues. Diane has been with FHWA for 20 years in various positions working on a variety of transportation related air quality matters, including energy use, alternative fuels, and freight emissions. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in public administration from the Pennsylvania State University and a master's degree in public administration from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Before joining USDOT, Diane worked at the US Environmental Protection Agency on fuel related issues. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists for joining us. And to kick this off, um, I'm gonna just um, ask a question that each of you can kind of use to introduce your, your role in all of, uh, all of these issues around EV infrastructure. So the federal government is now taking a large role in funding charging infrastructure for the first time with $5 billion for state formula funds and another 2.5 billion for competitive grants. How can we make sure that money is invested effectively? How do you each see your roles in that process? And how does it change? How does that role change with this new funding? Um, and we'll uh, start with Chris. All right, uh, th thank you, Chris. Um, I uh, appreciate the introduction and, and the opportunity to participate. Thank you, uh, Forth, and everybody who's who's joined us today. Um, you know, it's uh, definitely an exciting time uh, to to be working in electric vehicles, transportation electrification generally, and and especially with the um, charging infrastructure deployment that we're all getting ready to participate in. We're all very excited about. I um, was very lucky a couple of weeks ago to uh, be up in DC for the. Um, official announcement uh, of the program when when DOT released guidance and um, uh, it's just it's uh, it's just exciting to to see this come to fruition. You know, at at the Electrification Coalition, we're really focused on making sure that this deployment of infrastructure is efficient, effective, and equitable. And it's not just like three E's that sound good when you say them together, but they're also really important to to make sure that this infrastructure opportunity um, is delivered effectively. Uh, if not, then you know we're not going to get any more money. And that's the most important thing here is that uh, this uh, investment be a success. Uh, and so, you know, in our work to date with states and cities across the country, um, you know, we recognize that there are taken into consideration when thinking about how to invest, uh, how, to, how to deploy this, this investment from the federal government and things that the federal government should take into consideration when trying to figure out how to work with states and cities um, to most effectively deploy the money. Um, you know, one of the, the really cool things about this opportunity is that um, federal investment like this, government investment like this, uh, provides an opportunity to um, uh, fill some charging gaps in ways that meets some policy goals that you don't just get when you are making a charging infrastructure investment based on whatever the return on investment is um, for the company that's installing the charging stations. And so 
that's one thing that we've learned from states and cities is that when they become involved in these decisions, then the infrastructure investments can be made, you know, thinking about how do we um, provide access for everyone? How can we fill gaps uh, in our charging network so that, you know, you can make sure that you are um, facilitating that, that EV tourism route, right? So I, I'm in Virginia. Uh, a lot of folks near me go to the Outer Banks in North Carolina for a vacation. How do we make sure that you can get from Richmond to the Outer Banks um, in your electric vehicle? And so, um, you know, filling those gaps, making sure that we provide charging access for everyone is something that's really important. And, and at the Electrification Coalition, we're going to be spending the next year working with cities, working with states um, to build their capacity, uh, help provide that expertise um, so that the, their plans can, can be effective, that they can be efficient, uh, that they can be equitable, and hopefully working with our federal partners like Carol and Diane uh, to help them understand the things that states and cities need to, um, to deploy that money in the best way. Because we all want this just to be like the first seven and a half billion and we want billions and billions more to come. That's what we need for, for this full transition. Thanks, Chris. Josh, want to give us your take? Great, thanks, Chris. Um, thank you to Forth and Symbiot for including me and Greenlots in this webinar. Just a few, a few words about Greenlots. Um, I imagine most people associated with Forth are already familiar with Greenlots, but for those who are not familiar with us, and what we do, we are an EV charging technology and services company. We have more than a decade of experience in the industry. We've deployed projects in 13 countries around the world. And our core product is a software platform for managing charging. Our customers include fleet operators, light, medium, and heavy duty, municipalities, electric utilities, automotive OEMs, and others. Amazon, UPS, and Penske are three examples of companies that we're working with to help electrify their fleets. Um, our solutions can include full turnkey installation of smart network charging stations. We can focus on the cloud-based platform on the back end. We can do driver-facing mobile apps. It all depends on the needs of our customers. And three years ago, GreenLots was purchased by Shell. And next month, you are going to see uh, GreenLots name change over to Shell Recharge Solutions, which is all part of Shell's global ambition and commitment to deploy half a million charging ports by 2025 and two and a half million by 2030. So uh, to answer your question, Chris, um, as Chris Bass said, this is an incredibly exciting time for those of us in the industry and folks who've been in the industry longer than I have, who've been kind of chugging away and plotting away to really get to this inflection point. Now, all of a sudden, it's, it's all happening everywhere fast. And so to Diane and Coral and your colleagues, thank you all for the huge amount of work you've been doing just over the past year, um, and Diane and others even before, right? Um, but just trying to implement this bipartisan infrastructure law. So um, to address some of the specifics of your question, Chris, in terms of how GreenLots sees our role um, in helping make sure that this money is invested effectively and in this process, our role is to really help inform uh, the decision makers. And so it starts with, or it started with Congress and with FHWA, uh, Green Lots through Shell submitted uh, comments to inform um, the actual guidance that came out. And we're going to continue to be um, engaged in the standard setting process and, and as that goes forward. But to a large extent, the process really shifts to the 50 states in DC and Puerto Rico as the, as the states have a, a very relatively short turnaround time to develop their plans. So for those of us in the industry, there is some precedent, uh, particularly with the Volkswagen settlement funding, right? Where uh, states had to develop their beneficiary mitigation plans, green lots, many of our other industry colleagues and stakeholders um, need to be engaging with the state DOTs and energy offices to share our perspective. Um, from GreenLots, uh, or for GreenLots in particular, as a charging software and services company, a lot of the, the emphasis that we focus on has to do with considerations around charging. Things like the business model or business models around deploying and owning and operating charging stations and, and where some of the pressure points are and some of the considerations that states may want to consider to help 
uh, support private investment and get these charging stations deployed. Software to manage charging is a really critical element of this whole enterprise, and it's going to become even more critical as software, particularly this fast char these fast charging stations across the country start being deployed both in urban and rural areas. And interoperability is another key um, pillar of the approach that Greenlots takes and the approach that we encourage states to take, uh, both to help prevent stranded assets, but also to help support a really uh, seamless and optimal driver experience. So I'll pause there and uh, thanks again for uh, having this webinar. Thanks, Josh. Carl, can you give us a sense of your role and your thoughts on this new federal investment? Yes, thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you all and thank you to Forth for um, scheduling this event. Um, you know, adding to what Chris and Josh mentioned, we're very excited about the new uh, Navy Foreign Rule Program that we just recently announced about two weeks ago, along with some guidance that explains in detail uh, the requirements of the states need to comply with in terms uh, of them getting the funding. Um, what we announced two weeks ago is pretty much part number one of the, of the two parts of funding that we're gonna be announcing throughout the year. So the $5 billion are um, funds that have been allocated to the states for um, building infrastructure along the interstate corridors and some of the segments of the national highway system. Um, there's a series of steps that I think Chris and Josh mentioned um, during their introduction that the states need to comply with before they can start utilizing the funds to, to build this infrastructure. Um, one, of this, one of the steps is for them to develop state EV deployment plans, um, which is gonna include a lot of information in terms of how they're coordinating with stakeholders, uh, with disadvantaged communities, rural communities where a lot of the infrastructure is gonna be built. Um, and a lot of other inf information that um, is gonna be key to make sure that we have a reliable and interconnected network at a national level. Um, again, there's a lot of information in the guidance, I believe I, um, I shared the, the website uh, with Symbiad. You can find that information in driveelectric.gov. Um, you know, along with the guidance, we, we also announced that there's a new joint program office between DOT and DOE, um, where we're going to be working and collaborating to provide technical assistance to stakeholders uh, across the country. Now that there's, it's a critical point for them to start building um, and developing the state deployment plan. So uh, if you go to that website, you can find a lot of resources, information, including the guidance. And again, you can contact us and, and ask any questions that you have in relationship to the funding and the requirements in the state. Um, and later throughout the year, we're going to be announcing the other discretionary uh, programs, which are going to be a complement to the $5 billion that, that we just announced. A distinction between those two programs, the $5 billion, again, or the goal of that program is to connect a nationwide network to um, reduce range anxiety. So you can feel comfortable driving, driving from D.C. to California in your, in your electric vehicle. That's, that's the goal of this program. And then the other discretionary programs, the goal is to fill the gaps within the system to make sure that we provide that infrastructure to communities across the country in rural areas and disadvantaged community and rural areas, I'm sorry, in urban areas as well um, that might not have access to, to this infrastructure um, as well. So um, there's other requirements specifically with alternative fuel corridors that I'm gonna let Diane talk about since she's the subject matter expert. Thanks, Carl, and thanks to uh, Forth for holding uh, another informative webinar, and I can't wait to get to that roadmap meeting in June. It's been a long time since we've all been together, uh, so we're all looking forward to that. But as Carl said, um, you know, two pieces of guidance were issued on February 10th, and one was the NEVI formula program guidance, and the other piece was the round six request for nominations. And first, let me say, it's been a really, for me, a really neat experience being in um, for five years now in the beginning of the program under the FAST Act and us designating corridors and setting up this, this national process um, in anticipation of money and funding for the actual corridors. And um, I'm not sure I've ever experienced that before, but it's really neat to see uh, a program being set up and then actually 
you know, uh, once they, you know, everyone's worked so hard, the state environmental energy transportation agencies, along with, I can't forget our clean cities coordinators across the country, they were just instrumental in getting this program up and running and then to see, you know, the funding coming down the pike. So it's been a really great experience for me personally. Um, but back to the request for nomination, I think everyone knows that we've been doing this for five years now. Of course, this one has a little bit of a different flavor to it, um, this round six, because it's obviously tied to the NEVI program guidance. Uh, they're like companion documents. And um, the round six requests for nominations are uh, due to Federal Highway on May 13th. Um, so the states will be working hard to decide, uh, along with their stakeholders and other sister agencies in the state, to decide uh, which corridors they want to nominate again. And um, I think the way um, it works is, uh, and I always tell folks this, if I were a state, uh, you know, I'd first look at my ready, my ready corridors and see, look at the infrastructure on them and see if that infrastructure meets uh, the requirements in the NEVI guidance. Um, and we know full and well that a lot of corridors won't. And that's the purpose of the funding is to upgrade that infrastructure on those corridors and make sure that ready status is intact. And then look at your pending corridors and see what gaps need to be filled and also the existing infrastructure as well as the new infrastructure and make sure that's meeting the, the NEVI guidelines. Um, as everyone knows too, this the Request for nominations is about EV infrastructure, but it also includes CNG, LNG, hydrogen, and propane infrastructure fueling funding for that. So, um, you know, we continue to promote uh, the nomination of corridors for all those alternative fuels, but obviously, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the focus is on electric vehicle infrastructure. And we just look forward to uh, what. Uh, nominations we're going to get in and how we it's been a real interesting um uh i don't know experience trying to bring all these pieces together and um you know there's a delicate balance between what is um needed on the national level from a national perspective and giving flexibility to the states uh so they can build out their program the way they want and um we're hoping that uh, it all works out, and um, there's great people involved um, from the Department of Energy. The um, the initiation and uh, of the development of the Joint Program Office, um, I think, is a great. The Joint Program uh, Energy and Transportation Office was a great step forward. Um, transportation Energy is a great nexus, and we finally have an office that addresses both. So um, I'll just stop there and. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Diane. And this is a great sort of level set and we got a sense of, you know, what's the funding that's coming through, what states need to do in terms of providing plans. Um, but, you know, that kind of brings up a question, which is, which is, um, you know, and this, you know, and, and Chris, the call for, you know, kind of what this program needs to do overall in terms of setting the stage, because this is hopefully just the beginning in terms of our investment in EV in infrastructure. But what should uh, local jurisdictions and states be thinking about what's your advice to them in terms of what they should do. And I'd, I'd like to pass this to Josh first as our as our former elected official from a local jurisdiction and maybe give his thoughts first, but I'm sure others will have thoughts as well. So Josh. Sure, I would just say, um, start with a vision for what you want to accomplish. And it's a little different for the, for the NEVI program and as it will be for the competitive grant program, for the competitive grant program, local governments are eligible applicants and can apply directly for the funding, unlike the NEVI program, uh, where it goes to the states first. But the, the, the main point is, um, have an idea of what you as a jurisdiction want your transportation infrastructure to be five years from now, and figure out how these funds can help you achieve that, as opposed to just seeing this, this funding coming and saying, okay, let's you know, cobble something together real quick so we can get this money out the door, which will help. But in my view, it won't uh, have as big as an big of an impact as it will if there's a broader community-based, stakeholder-based vision in place that you're trying to achieve. Um, one of the exciting things for me about these two programs is that there is so much uh, 
either requirements or guidance considerations in these two programs, even though the, the competitive grant guidance hasn't come out yet. Uh, but it's really an opportunity for states and counties and cities and regional organizations to try and address underserved areas, particularly for the, the competitive grant program that will be coming out and with some of the, the specific guidance and set asides for underserved low and moderate income communities, communities with high proportions of multifamily residents. Um, so I, that, that's my recommendation. Ha, have a in, uh, community informed, stakeholder informed vision, and then see how this funding can help you achieve that. Thanks, Josh. Does anyone have anything to add in terms of what states or local communities should be thinking about? Yeah, I'll jump in uh, real briefly, Chris, and, and just add to, you know, first off, agree with everything Josh said. Uh, and, and also, you know, looking for opportunities to leverage this investment uh, and turn it into something more, right? I mean, $7.5 billion is a tremendous amount of money, of course. Um, but what's really going to be a measure of success is how do we take that $7.5 billion and turn it into, you know, more money and also more policy change and more systems change, right? I mean, that's how we're really going to know whether or not we were successful or whether we just took seven and a half billion dollars and installed seven and a half billion dollars with the charging infrastructure, right? So while well, that would be great, um, you know, what would really move the needle is is making sure this isn't just a one-time thing. So looking for opportunities to um, uh, leverage private capital to um, combine the federal investment with uh, different pots of state funding. Um, philanthropic dollars on on both the the vehicle side and the charging side. Let's put this money to work um, as part of a overall package that includes not just the seven and a half billion dollars of federal investment, um, but those other sources of money too. And look for those ways that the the financial investment can be a catalyst for policy change. What policy windows, to use a nerdy MPA term that. Um, I, I know Diane, with her excellent Virginia Tech education, will appreciate what policy windows do do they do, do this opportunity open up, right? For maybe it's a curbside charging, maybe it's um, EV readiness ordinances at the local level. How how can we take this um, all the enthusiasm around creating charging infrastructure plans uh, and um, translate that into uh, some 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 power built to to affect policy change. I think that's going to be one of the ways that we can really make a lasting difference with this investment. Yeah, and Chris, I would just I would just add that um you know, we've had a great precedent uh, in terms of state and locals working together and agencies within states working together with the VW settlement funds and um I jokingly but somewhat not jokingly tell folks keep all those email addresses of the people you work with and their names and, and contact numbers because uh, that's the folks you need to gather again. And, uh, you know, in terms of developing the plan and figuring out, you know, what infrastructure is going to look like for your state. So um, I think that's, you know, that was some great experience in preparation for, for this. Um, I will also add that I think there's two key words that I would like to, to hear as we continue to work with stakeholders, which is communication and coordination. You know, we can talk about all the requirements from the law, but at the end of the day, what we want to see in the state deployment plans is that state DOTs coordinate with MPOs, counties, municipalities, nonprofits, private sector, with everyone. Um, we want to make sure that all the communities are represented in those plans and that we fully understand what are the needs for these networks to be fully and efficient, efficiently built across um, the states. Um, so to me, that's going to be a key part of all of the funding that we're going to be providing to states and to other stakeholders. And I would add that, um, you know, we're looking forward to reviewing all of the plans, but um, there are 10% um, of the funds that can be allocated uh, on a competitive basis um, based, based on the discretion of the secretary. And those funds can go to local entities to fill the gaps within the network. So, there's opportunities for um, local stakeholders to, to receive funds um, from the state, um, the NEVI formula program um, as a competitive basis based on the secretary's discretion. So more, more opportunity than may meet the eye initially. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanna step back for a second and, and kind of set um, vehicle electrification in 
this greater context that, you know, what we're really trying to do here, or I think a lot of us are trying to do is, is address um, the climate crisis and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from tr the transportation sector and electrification, um, you know, from my organization's perspective is a um, essential, but, but, is, but not sufficient to get the whole job done. Um, and when you think about how electric vehicles are less expensive to operate, they're, they, they go further for, for the amount of money, they're actually cheaper to maintain, um, you um, can see, start to see something um, called the rebound effect or the take back effect, where because it's cheaper to, to drive further, people start to drive further. Um, and if that ends up generating more miles, then it kind of dampens the, the, the uh, reduction in, in greenhouse gases that we actually achieve from, from electrifying. Um, and so um, this is kind of open questions to anyone on the panel who wants to take it is, how do we keep that from happening? Well, people are really jumping at the at, to answer this question. You know, I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll be the, sacri the sacrificial lamb here. And, and mostly because, uh, you know, I spent the previous four years of my life, uh, you know, working on, on this issue um, from a client perspective, right? I mean, that's um, uh, sort of central to, to why I do this work. And, um, you know, I think the first thing we can do is as transportation advocates, as climate advocates, as electric vehicle advocates, we have to realize um, that uh, we are all in this together. We are all on the same team. Um, and, um, you know, our number one objective uh, is to, you know, and, and this relates to, to, you know, at the Electrification Coalition, um, one of our sort of central organizing principles is to, you know, secure um, uh, America's energy future by ending our dependence on, on foreign sources of energy and foreign sources of oil. Uh, and electric vehicles are critical to that. I mean, there's you know, the fact that we're having this conversation this week um, when when so much uh, is happening in sort of global energy politics uh, and global energy security or, or around what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and Europe um, and, and natural gas being such a, a key part of this just really drives the point home that, you know, renewable energy, electric vehicles, um, you know, electrifying everything is just, you know, crucial to not only how we solve the climate crisis, um, but also how we solve um, the energy crisis and, and so many other major issues, uh, you know, so so remembering that we're working together, right? Like uh, too often I see transit advocates and EV advocates fighting with each other over whose solution is best. Um, and, and, and we're re really what we know is that that we need we need all of it, um, you know, just uh, just transitioning to EVs is, is, is not sufficient for reducing emissions. But um, if we don't do that, then we're not going to make it right. So um, it is a vital, uh, vital part of, of, of the mix. And the modeling that, that states have done to look at um, how to achieve emissions reductions at the scale required by the science of climate change means that we need rapid electrification in the next 10 years. Um, and that is you know, the single best thing that we can do. And while we do that, we need to tackle all the other challenges inherent in our transportation system, right? Um, if, you know, reducing VMT, figuring out our, our, our land use. But if we're not uh, involved in rapidly electrifying every piece of our transportation system, um, then all the other stuff isn't going to solve the problem either. I would just add that um, building on what Chris said, we need to decarbonize our transportation sector and reduce the carbon emissions associated with it. Um, I think the question kind of implies that if we do that, and if there is this rebound effect because it is cheaper to own and operate an EV over the life of a vehicle, so then you have more people driving or more miles driven, um, there's an assumption in the question that we will then need wider streets and then there'll be more stormwater runoff. And I don't uh, necessarily accept that premise that if more people are driving EVs, then these other local land use implications will happen. Because I mean, for me personally, uh, one of the exciting developments in land use that's going on is this strong move towards complete streets and multimodal transportation, including bicycle and pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And even federally, the Department of Transportation has um, information about clean streets and resources available for that. And so um, I, I, I don't think we should slow down this move towards EVs, but it, the question does 
uh, raise an important point that we also need to be thinking about how we're also going to address impervious surface and runoff and, you know, supporting bicycle and pedestrian and other modes as well. I will also add that, um, you know, VOT is working efficiently in implementing a lot of the different provisions and new programs within the bipartisan infrastructure law. EV is just one of the first of many um, to come this year. So, you know, we have other funding mechanisms for resiliency, climate change, and we have a series of policies that we're implementing to make sure that all of those factors are taken into consideration into some of the legacy programs that we have and, again, some of the new programs that we're going to be rolling out. You know, we have, for example, the PROTECT formula program, which is going to be for planning, resiliency, community, uh, community engagement, at-risk coastal infrastructure. That alone is $7.3 billion. Um, you know, that's another example of a new program that, uh, you know, will add value in terms of all the work that we're trying to move forward with climate change, equity, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's more to come, you know, NAVI is just the, the first step of, of a lot of different things that the department is working on. So, um, we're very excited that, you know, we're promoting those new values within, within the department and to our stakeholders as well. Thank you all. Um, great, uh, insight into that. Um, I do see a question from the audience that I really want to make sure we get to um, from, I think it's Susan Mudd, how is the Justice 40, how is Justice 40 being reflected in the way uh, that DOT funding will be spent? Um, and I also, if you want to broaden this out to sort of equity in general, that would be great too. So maybe Coral, would you want to take Yeah, that? I can quickly answer that question. So uh, the NEVI formula program is one of our Justice 40 uh, programs. So um, it's a a Biden initiative in which 40% uh, of the funding for specific programs need to be targeted to benefits for disadvantaged communities. So we've identified this program as a, as a Justice 40 program. So um, we continue to do work at DOT to make sure that we identify uh, the right programs that will comply with that criteria, but um, NEVI formula is one of the Justice 40 ones. Um, and then how would this, is there any like sense of how that would relate to investment in rural communities? Or just like anything you can say so about at least, Yeah, at least for NEVI formula, um, you know, within the relationship of that program in rural communities, a lot of the investment that we expect from NEVI is going to be in rural areas because um, some of the criteria for the funding is that the stations are, are built every 50 miles within a mile along the interstate system. Um, and again, it's to reduce range anxiety. So, you know, we want to see stations built along, you know, large sections of the interstate uh, in Montana, for example, you know, in, in states that we know we have corridors that are located in, in very rural areas. So there's going to be benefit to those communities. Those communities usually also don't have a lot of transit available to them and they rely a lot on vehicles. So hopefully we, we can see that the impact that the, this infrastructure is gonna have um, in some sort of way is gonna promote, you know, the use of EVs in rural areas as well, so. I would just, yeah, um, go ahead. No, I was just I was just gonna add, you know, when you look at our, our alternative fuel quarter maps and specifically, of course, the EV map, you know, our pending and ready quarters run through all over the country through rural areas, through disadvantaged areas, through tribal lands, national parks. So we have a very good start on, um, you know, uh, building equity into this program and, um, you know, making sure that, that everyone has uh, the same opportunities here. And, and I just add that in the NEVI guidance, there is a strong encouragement for the, for states in their plans to explain how they're going to meet these Justice 40 goals of delivering at least 40% of benefits to disadvantaged communities. And specifically, the guidance says that the state plans should explain how they're going to meet the executive order, how they're going to meet the interim Justice 40 guidance. And, um, and to Diane's point about mapping, how states are encouraged to use this Justice 40 mapping tool specifically for EV charging that's linked to in the NEVI guidance. So 
um, to Susan's question, I think a really strong uh, focus on the Justice 40 and the equity piece is really going to be in the development of each state's plan. That's where it needs to be addressed. You know, and if I could just add that, that's, I think, connected to the climate question, too. Um, at the beginning of this month, the Electrification Coalition released our uh, electrification, um, our rural electrification guidebook um, and our toolkit. It's a guidebook or a toolkit um, that, that talks about how we can accelerate the electrification of transportation in rural communities because, you know, uh, rural communities account for something like 20% of the American population, but 70% of our road miles. Right. And so, um, you know, to electrify transportation means that we really need to um, to figure out how we not only get more electric vehicle charging, but um, more electric vehicles of all classes uh, into rural communities. And um, this is a great way to do that. Many rural communities um, are also equity communities, uh, whether they are um, for legacy um, uh, industries in Virginia. We have uh, uh, in Southwest Virginia and Appalachia. Um, have significant low income populations um, that are struggling with energy transition uh, and um, is a great way to um, layer in a number of policy priorities um, with uh, one tool here. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm also seeing um, a question or two in the chat about kind of like the, the customer experience, you know, as folks are thinking about buying vehicles you know, and, and so I think there's a, a few things that that brings to mind that, that maybe panelists can address. I mean, one is just kind of like what role is there in terms of outreach to to let folks know about this charging infrastructure and that, you know, they can have more certainty around, um, you know, the ability to get where they want to go in their electric vehicle. And I think another piece is, you know, when you think about charging, we've talked a little bit about rural communities. But in more urban communities, the parking situations might be different. People might not have access to an outlet um, where they can have charging where they park overnight if they're, you know, an individual owner of a vehicle. Um, so how how can we address some of these issues in terms of informing potential EV owners about how to address some of these challenges, um, and you know, or or to give them the information to know that they can address them. Maybe Chris, I'll pass this to you first, and then. Sure. You know, I'll just say from a um, uh, on a from a policy perspective, this gets to exactly what I was talking about earlier, right? That um, this is an opportunity with with this um, the the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law provides us um, a significant funding opportunity to look at okay, how do we answer just this question with um, policy change that can help deliver for consumers so that they can be more confident that their um, charging needs are going to be met. And so examples of that could be EV readiness ordinances. We're seeing um, more EV readiness ordinances pop up across the country where, for example, a, a, an EV readiness ordinance would require that um, a new construction of, a, of a, a parking lot or a parking garage or multifamily housing, um, that, that new construction or major renovation um, have some level of EV readiness, whether that's just the conduit laid or actual um, uh, outlets or uh, installed infrastructure in the, the, the building or parking lot um, at, at the time of the construction or renovation. You know, we, uh, I, I worked for the, the city of Seattle some years ago, and, and one of the things that, that we always said when we were working on EV readiness ordinances was that, you know, uh, you wouldn't build a bathroom without a sink, and you shouldn't build a parking lot without a charging station. Um, that's just where we're at now, right? Um, and so uh, it's an important thing for, for cities to consider. Or, you know, curbside charging is another one um, where there's a lot of competition for the curb space uh, in cities and figuring out how we can balance charging needs with transit, bike lanes, um, uh, other types of public realm access is really important. And so um, looking at the whole suite of policy approaches that local governments could take to facilitate more charging, um, just more density charging, more ubiquitousness of charging uh, can really help those who don't have easy access right now, um, make sure they have it. Uh, and, and that adds just a layer of comfortability so that when folks go to, to, to make that next vehicle purchase, um, they're gonna have comfort that they can get an EV and, and, and know when and how they're gonna charge it. I I don't have a clear answer to the question, but the question is an important one because it does highlight the importance of 
uh, consumer outreach and education and marketing, which we know from experience in the industry is really important to support participation. Um, and so, I mean, one of the things we're all aware of, just everyone talks about the Super Bowl, and you can just track each Super Bowl in recent years to see the growth yeah. of EV related ads. Um, the, uh, the Biden administration, I think, has gotten a lot of, uh, you know, deserved and positive coverage across a variety of media about the various announcements that's been happening um, related to these programs. Um, but more needs to be done, particularly at the local level and by the states. And so it's, it's unclear exactly to what extent the NEVI funding may be used specifically for education and outreach. Um, but from my perspective with Green Lots, one of the things I want to encourage, whether it's part of the NEVI, the specific NEVI funding or not, is a plan for education and outreach and consumer awareness and how to leverage stakeholders. One of the um, things that we know works well is when electric utilities really promote electric vehicle usage because local utilities are often a known and trusted kind of advisor when it comes to electrical stuff, right? And so um, we know that when there is a budget and when there's a concerted effort for outreach and marketing, that it does make a difference. So uh, like I said, I don't have a, a clear answer right now for how that's going to manifest in all these state plans, but it's an important question and it, and it should be addressed. Yeah, I, I agree with Josh. It's, it's, you know, we're, we have to wait and see how this is going to play out, right? It's a, it's a relatively new program. And I think your question is an excellent one. Um, you know, I live in an urban area in Washington, D.C., and I often hear a lot of people say, I would love to have an EV, but I don't have anywhere to charge it because there's barely any park or parking to begin with in the city. So it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, this funding is going to play out, you know, with specifically the discretionary portion of, of the funding that we're going to provide. Um, but, you know, all of the state plans are going to be available in, in the driveelectric.gov website, and it's going to be publicly available information for us to analyze and obviously improve as we continue to use the funding for uh, building this infrastructure. So uh, we have a very positive outlook and we think there's going to be tons of good things happening, but obviously there's always going to be room for improvement and to do better things. So I think, again, one of the key things to do is have conversations like this, right? And continue to coordinate and communicate um, and, and see how we can improve things and, and make the best network that we can with this running available. Yeah, and I would just add that um, I think, you know, the, the transparency in this whole process and us, you know, being able to publish and upload state plans to the JPO website, I mean, states learn from one another. And, um, you know, they talk to one another and that's the great thing about it um, is that this, this isn't done in, you know, a black hole. Um, you know, the plans will be up there. Um, everyone's free to talk to everyone. And, um, you know, with the, with the corridor so far, that has happened. And, um, you know, states who were in the lead gave some great advice to states just starting out. And that's what we expect to happen here too. Chris, and I, if I can add one thing, because I think we've mentioned state DOTs quite often, um, but there's the DOA portion of this work, right? And for example, we're coordinating with NASIO as well. We want to make sure that the utility companies are part of this conversation. You know, they're a key stakeholder for this. So it's not just like state DOTs and people that are, you know, building the infrastructure. It's a combination of a lot of stakeholders. So everyone is part of this conversation. Yeah, thanks for that. If, if, we, if we had more time for this panel, could, we could really dig into some stuff around the connection with utilities. But um, I did want to get to something I saw in the from an audience question. I think is uh, you know an area we should explore, which is medium and heavy duty vehicles. What's the potential for these programs to be um, set up so that they're also going to benefit? You know, what are some of the biggest vehicles that you know produce some pretty outsized emissions for you know the number of vehicles? So. Um, I don't know, maybe can I pass that to Diane for starters and share what, what your thoughts are? 
Sure. Um, I think, you know, obviously, um, no pun intended, that's coming down the road and uh, we have to be we have to be ready for that in terms of power levels and um, looking at the criteria that's needed uh, for, you know, medium electri electrification and medium heavy duty. If um, I'm sure folks have seen in um, the legislation or the law, the bill that um, a year out from November, uh, we are to be designating um, freight corridors. So we'll be working with our with our colleagues at Federal Highway um, in the Office of Operations where Coral used to work there. And, um, you know, coordin coordinating with them on um, freight issues and figuring out with our colleagues in the JPO uh, criteria for that and, um, you know, planning for that electrification of medium and heavy duty because I think it'll be here sooner than we all think. I'll just say that that's one thing that that states will, um, you know, that may be a little bit different from the Volkswagen example. So the, the Volkswagen settlement funds mm -hmm. were great practice in a lot of ways for a lot of states. Uh, you know, I mean, in, in, in Virginia, for, for example, you know, our 15 percent accounted for about 14 million dollars uh, that we put into a high powered uh, uh, highway charging network. Uh, Virginia is going to get, um, you know, at least 15 million dollars in year one. Of this funding, right? So um, it's an extraordinary um, uh, level up, I guess, in the amount of, of resources available. And so that practice that states had, not just on charging infrastructure, but on on heavy duty electrification, really helps states figure out okay, what's different about medium and heavy duty. And, and we know from talking to some of our our business partners at the EC that um, you know the needs for freight electrification are a little bit different than light duty elect electrification. And so it's a lot different. You know, whether that's, um, uh, you know, on a campus like a distribution center or a port facility or whether that's, um, you know, on the road or in a community uh, when a truck is out, you know, making rounds or making deliveries or traveling from point A to point B. And so um, for states, you know, the, the stakeholder engagement mm -hmm. with this um, with uh, freight business, par business partners is going to be really important to, to make sure that as their charging plans are being developed, they're considering the unique charging needs, uh, dwell times. Um, and other factors that that are um, part of of the sort of uh, heavy duty charging experience. Um, I would just add uh, a couple things. One is I'm really interested to see, uh, as Diane mentioned, what these uh, freight uh, corridors look like um, when that comes out. I guess in November, um, and how we can or how collectively that relates to the NEVI funding and what opportunities there may be, because a lot of medium and heavy duty charging um, can use the 150 kilowatt fast charging that mm -hmm. is required by NEVI. So, I mean, it can serve double duty. But just another point is that um, I'm not, I personally, Green Lots, we're not looking to the NEVI program and even the two and a half billion grant program um, as the only charging infrastructure program out there, particularly when it comes to some of these different applications. And so uh, just in the bipartisan infrastructure law, for instance, there are these other programs which Coral and others have mentioned, um, reducing truck emissions at port facilities. There's a SMART grant program. There's a carbon reduction program between mm -hmm. DOT and DOE. Um, even if charging infrastructure is not the primary focus, um, infrastructure is often an eligible expense as part of replacing vehicles as well. So there are other opportunities beyond these two programs for addressing medium and heavy duty. Thanks for that. Um, so we're running a little low on time. There is one question I wanted to get to that maybe is a little bit related to medium and heavy duty vehicles because there's a heavy duty vehicle known as a bus. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> This is maybe a little less related to charging and more to overall picture of how we electrify the transportation system. But as we look to electrify public transit, um, you know, there's a risk that because electric buses cost more than gas powered buses that we could, you know, end up with spending more money on electrification and have not as much improvement in, in public transit service as we might otherwise have, which, you know, obviously wouldn't help us to further our overall goals. Um, and so I'm hoping that's maybe something folks can touch on and then maybe ask Coral first, just because of your past with the FTA, to see if you touch on it first. Yes, uh, 
Thanks for asking that question. I was actually going to mention something about the great work FTA is doing um, with electric buses. They're also providing funding mechanisms and doing great work promoting the use of those vehicles um, through our transit agencies in the country. Um, they're also working with us in the joint program office. Um, there's a potential of maybe additional funding for electric charging stations and funding coming from FTA uh, for those purposes. So there's great work that FTA is doing in that in that sense. And I would just add that I think sustainable technologies, you know, people usually think that in the short term it's it's not valuable, right? But when we look at the long term, um, we see that you know the cost savings do make sense, you know, to make those investments. Um, we see it all across the range in terms of sustainable technologies. So um, it might be more of, of an expensive, um, you know, purchase at the beginning, but we're seeing very good and, and positive um, um, benefits from, from the investments that FTA has, has done so far in terms of electric buses. Anyone want to add anything else? Public transit. Great. Well, we're um, we're pretty close to time here, so I'm, I want to just give a huge thanks to our panelists. This was great to have you all on and have your perspectives as we as we discuss how we're going to electrify our transportation system. Um, and I am going to now pass it back to Cindy to wrap us up. So, Cindy, do you want to take it from here? <laughs> Yes, thank you all so much uh, for joining the conversation today. Uh, we hope to continue the conversation um, in an email format if you have any additional questions. Uh, we did not get to all of the questions today, but we hope to keep the conversation going. This is not a one hour conversation. <laughs> so thank you all so much to our panelists. Thank you, Chris, for moderating the panel and leading the conversation. We do have a one quick poll question while we sign out. Um, did you find this webinar informative? We want to make sure we're keeping information, highlighting information and highlighting content and emerging content in the industry. So thank you so much for answering that. Give it one more minute. Okay. And as we close, you can see uh, the contact information for our panelists here. Um, we will be sending a recap email with more information and additional resources. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to capture this, but they will also be CC'd in the email we send out. Uh, we hope you can join us in two weeks on Tuesday, March 8th, for our next webinar on Plugged In, a driver-centric approach, a driver-centered approach to electric, electrifying rideshare. We'll be joined um, by rideshare companies on a conversation on how rideshare companies can center the driver's essential needs as we're electrifying that sector as well. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate you spending this hour with us. Um, have a great rest of your Tuesday. <laughs> um, again, thank you so much. We appreciate you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, panelists.